Alrighty, so today we are going to review all the games that happened yesterday, and like I said from my preview yesterday, I was thinking about doing the review the next morning because you can probably tell from my voice when I did my preview that I was absolutely exhausted, and by the time the game between Columbus versus Inter Miami was finished, because remember in that game they had a long weather delay at halftime, it was already around 9.30 my time and 12.30 a.m. Eastern time, and I was also still working on writing all the notes on the board. Yeah, it was going to be like around 10 or 10.30 at the earliest that I can start the review. And as much as I know you guys love my MLS After Dark review that I did a couple weeks ago, yeah, I probably won't try to do do that that again. And, you know, you want me to have a little bit more energy to talk about these games than what I would have given you guys uh, from yesterday. But that being said, speaking of these games that happened yesterday, well, if you were the home team, uh, it was a great night. For you because pretty much all the home team were able to get a win except for my team because yeah that of course ha happened that of course my team team is the only team that did not win at home but we start off with the first game which is Montreal versus the Chicago Fire and you know coming into this game it was very big for Montreal to you know you know get a win at home because you know it's not because of the fact that that they they are in any ways have some playoff implication I mean they're probably gonna finish second in the Eastern Conference and at worst they'll probably finish and near the the top four of the Eastern Conference and they'll at least have one home game but the thing is is that they have not done well this season at home as stars to Pudo and that they desperately need to get a home win so that they can gain their confidence that once the the playoffs begin and once they have their their first round playoff game at home that they can of course get get a victory and this is definitely a direction to the right way though it was definitely not not easy because uh in the first 15 minutes i thought there was a couple of early chances for both of these teams the needer kind of trouble either goalkeeper kamara has the first big opportunity but he blasted wide from long range but then the 20th minute he would score and this was actually a redirect shot that he had from Kone. so a little bit fortunate from kai kamara there but at the at the same time i mean that's just classic Sick number nine and kind of Kai Kamara being a poacher, being in the right place, right time to redirect that one in. And yeah, Montreal was leading one nothing. Eight minutes later, he would score again. This time from Kone and Brogi odds to make it two nothing in favor of Montreal. Though it came off a bad turnover from from the fire. I mean, how many times I've said when you gave the ball away in your own half, you are basically asking of of getting conceded, and that's exactly what happened in this one. And that yeah, for Kai Kamara, what a performance. This was almost like throwback performance and a performance that just shows you that even at the age of 38, Kai Kamara can still ball and that he is still a guy that that, that is kind of almost become in a bit of an ageless wonder in MLS right now. Uh, in the 30th minute, uh, Duran looked to try to get a quick response for the fire, but he missed wide. But the fire did get a penalty in the 38th minute after Brezza brought down Duran in the box, which Shakiri was able to put away the penalty. And it was back to a one goal, goal deficit. Though that one goal deficit quickly t returned to two goals uh, for the Fire because in the 44th minute they concede again. It's Zachary Borgiard scoring from Kamara to make it 3 1 in favor of Montreal. So another guy that had a good game in this one, Borgiard, getting on the score sheet and also uh, getting the secondary assist off the Kamara uh, goal th that uh, he scored in the 28th minute. And we had to have time with Montreal leading 3 1. Though in the second half, uh, another penalty was given to the fire after VAR deemed that Waterman fouled Duran in the box. And this was a very interesting one because this was actually off the ball situation where it looked like maybe Waterman got a little bit too handsy on the face of, of Duran. And that, you know, I, I think that you could say that, that maybe that could, could be called a penalty. And remember, Original decision was the fact that this was not a penalty, and it has to be clear and obvious the fact that whether or not if if that that uh, is the deem a a uh, it wasn't the right right call by the original decision, and that again I just think that that was kind of maybe harsh to try try to overturn it, but nevertheless they did overturn it, and the fire was going to get their get a penalty for the second time tonight, and for the second time tonight Shakiri steps up and he slots home the penalty, and all of a sudden. The game was back to a one-goal lead, and it feels like the momentum was with the Fire because they started to dictate plays and were looking for the equalizer, though Toy did heads it just wide from close range in the 72nd minute before Kyoto heads it wide from the corner. I believe Kyoto late in this game did get subbed off of an injury, 
that is definitely a big concern for, for Montreal. And just also another example of the fact that Romel Kyoto, he's been having some, some issue with in, injuries these past couple of years. Like it feels like he's been having a tough time in terms of staying healthy and that kind of have hurt Montreal going for because we know he's a dangerous goal scorer for this team but there was no doubt that Montreal has regained momentum and they were looking for the dagger they were looking for that fourth goal to kill this game off and although they didn't find it they were able to walk away with a 3-2 win over the fire as the shots in this one 11 shots could be the six that the fire has three shots on goal could be the five that Montreal has four shots off target could be the three that the fire has two shots that was blocked could be the none that the fire has and possession wise 55% possession compared to the 45% possession that the fire has had and again Big win for Montreal to, to really get, get themselves some confidence that they can get these home victory that they're going to have to get when playoff times begin. And for the Fire, again, it's pretty much see you next, next season mode that they're, they're, they're counting on the day, days before they get eliminated from the MLS playoffs this season. But that being said, uh, moving on in the next match. We got Minnesota versus LAFC. And like I said, the Loons were the only team to not get a win at, at home out of all of these these matches that happen on Tuesday and this performance and really this one and the one that they had against the Portland Timbers look like it, it it's a performance from from back in May and from what I saw back in May from from this team it was not good what's whatsoever and this is where I am starting to get concerned again with the way that yeah you know not only they're in a bad form right now haven't won a single game in the last four match but, you know, we're getting to that part of the period where it's almost crunch time and that you've got to start to get some wins if you you can either get yourself a whole playoff game or even make the dance itself. Because I've said it before, as much as the Loons are, are currently in fifth in the Western Conference, there is right now a, a battle between third all the way down to seventh place and there's not much separated between all these teams and that, yeah, I mean, I mean these drop points is, is not going to help the, the Loons cost in terms of the, the playoff chances and also the, the, the fact that, you you know, that it's not going to help their chances to make the playoffs too because only four points above the, the red line right now. Though, that being said, uh, early in this game, I thought they were on the front foot and they were looking to try to get the opening goal. Though, there wasn't really much that was happening in the first 10 minutes because most of the chances that, that Minnesota had created, uh, it wasn't really tro troubling uh, Crepo that much. In fact, the first shot of the game came in the 15 minute as Orango uh, hits one right to Dane Sinclair. Then Boronga would hits the side netting after just a bad turnover from the Loons. And I thought LFC started getting into a usual group. Again, this is a team that always gets off to a slow start, but as they pick up, that's when they become dangerous. Though, on the 21st minute, uh, Armoria had a big opportunity as he struck the pulse from close range. And this came off of a lightning counterattack from the Loons. That was probably one of the best counterattack moves that they made this season and you know for Luis Amaria you know he's definitely have cooled off lately in these past couple of games and if this was uh inform Armaria as what we saw back in August and July he would bear us out that one in but unfortunately he struck the pulse here from close range then he had another chance just two minutes later but he heads it straight to Crepo and again uh, I thought despite the chances that, that the Loons were getting they were still looking a little bit disjointed on the attack and they were just moving the ball way too slow and again this really reminds me of what happened back in April and May when this team was just being way too slow when, whenever they go go on the, the build-up. And now when you move the ball way too slow on the attack, it just become, become predictable and you're not going to create a lot of chances. Uh, though in the 33rd minute, uh, Vela actually went through on goal and he tried to chip Dane Sinclair, but he missed it badly. And that's a rarity because whenever Vela goes through on goal, even if he tried to chip the keeper, he doesn't miss badly badly like that like he completely hits that one over into the wonder wall there uh but at the same time i also want to mention the fact that it's been 300 plus minutes since minnesota has last scored a goal the goal drought is is a problem for the the this team lee and that like i said this kind of reminds me of what happened back in april and may when this team also went through through a goal drought uh boxo trying to end that goal drought but he flicks it wide from close range before reynoso yeah, he should have scored here. I mean, he had had a big opportunity in 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 that that right side, and he basically just hits that one into the side netting. And half of the stadium thought that that went in. In fact, I originally thought that that went went into. And even I think maybe in the minds of Cal, Cal Williams, he was about to, to say that Reynoso sc scored there, but it actually hits the the side net, netting there. And that again, an informed Reynoso would not miss miss that. And that I also thought that this team was just stupid in terms. 
uh, of finishing because with how bad the finishing has been for the past couple of games, it was not a big surprise that that one did not go into the back of the net. Though, that being said, uh, a couple of minutes after that, that, that bad miss from Reynoso, this is where we get to the controversial moment of the game. And this is where we get to the moment where Adrian Heath was absolutely livid at halftime. So, Arango, he was already on the yellow card. The whistle has already been, been blown. And you know how when we see, see players, when the whistle is blown, they get, get frustrated that it was a foul on them, and then they basically kick the ball, ball away? Yeah, that is exactly what Chicho Arango did in this. And again, at halftime, uh, yeah, Adrian, he really ripped in, into the uh, fresh shading, and he even men mentioned uh, Arango, though informally, said that he, he probably shouldn't be on, on the pitch right now because of what he just did a couple of minutes to go and I, I don't blame uh he decided to to call out the referee i mean he probably will get a fine uh, a little bit later on from the disciplinary committee but yeah i mean this is something that i kind of wish more head coach maybe be 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 a more more kind of open about this because like i said refereeing you know as it has been the case for the past couple of years or even ever since pro was founded it has been bad and i know that you know arango was already on a yellow card but but you know again there's a reason why i've said said before this season where it seems like like pro has been been trying to crack down in terms of players just kicking the ball away there tends to be more stricter in terms of giving players a yellow card if they just clearly kick the the ball away out of frustration and here that is, that is exactly textbook of what exactly happened like arango clearly kicked the ball away and i don't care if he's already on yellow card that's a yellow card offense, and that should be be a a sending off to. And that again, you know, I don't know if that would have affect how the game game would be, but these are kind of just the mo moments that kind kind of frustrates me. And especially in in a, 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 a crunch time like we've seen, I really just hope that we don't get to one game where where a, re a bad referee decision would call cost a team in terms of the playoff hole, because that I think would be the worst case scenario. And we already seen this season that that of course, of course has ha happened and let's just hope that's not going to be the case but yeah Arango he is very lucky that he did not get sent off and not to mention uh when Arango actually got that yellow card literally about 10 seconds later he actually actually made another silly challenge and he could have easily got sent off in terms of that but was given a last warning so even if you have the argument the fact that uh maybe Arango was going to get a last warning for that no he already got a last last warning and then the referee decided to kind of had amnesia and decided to give Arango a last warning again even though he literally just did that a couple of minutes ago but that being said uh he did kind of got some car karma a couple of minutes later as Arango was wide o open from the from the 18 yard box so usually when Arango is wide open like that and with the goal scoring form that he's been in he buries that one one nine out of ten but again the soccer gods were gonna punish Arango go for for what he he did, and yeah, basically he missed that one wide on the free header, and it would be a costly miss for for LAFC because in the 45th minute, finally the Loons broke the the goal scoring drought. As Brent Coleman of all players scoring from Reynoso to make it one nothing in favor of Minnesota. I mean, as much as Coleman has getting a lot of criticism, at least he's a goal scorer. I mean, he already scored some two wonderful full headers from the corner, and he did exactly that in this play and yeah that gives Minnesota a one nothing lead heading into the second half now in the second half uh, Vela would then strike one right to Dane Sinclair uh, I thought the back line seemed solid so far and Dane Sinclair hasn't made a lot of out outrageous save and that was kind of one of the concern I have coming into this game because with how good LAFC is going for on the attack and the talent that they have and with the way that this back line has been very 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 shaky lately yeah, I was kind of concerned that they might give up a goal or two, two in, in this one. But up to that point, it was very, very solid. In fact, I would say that that back line has been really solid in these last two games. Like, besides that one mistake that they made against the Timbers, which sadly that was the mistake that caused them them uh, uh, getting nothing out of Portland. The back line has been, been much more, more solid in these last couple of games. Uh, Taylor then fires one into the Wonder Wall before Garcia would blast one into the stands. But then in the 63rd minute... LAFC equalized. It's Carlos Vela scoring from, from Acosta to tie the game up at one apiece because that's just a reminder that Carlos Vela is still class. I mean, he absolutely rifles this one from about 20 yards out. And while you know, it's one of those goal, goals that you basically tip your hat, hat off to Vela scoring another amazing goal, 
you maybe could qu question the the closing down there for the loons and the lack lack of it because you know when you of course course got a dangerous play breathing down your neck and coming into the 18 yard box maybe think about closing him down instead of letting him him have a free look of, of goal and had a chance to basically hit that one top in which is exactly what Valet did but that goal really changed the game a bit because the momentum was started with LAFC and they really started to dictate the players and look for the second goal there was a shout for a handball that was not given for Minnesota before Reynoso curls it wide on the free kick and really as the time winds down I thought Minnesota kind of regained that momentum back they were trying to press for for the league and I thought fatigue was starting to show for LAFC in fact I think fatigue kind of started to show for both team too because winding down the, the last 15 minutes just looked like both teams they, they just had it no they, they just want to walk away with a 1-1 draw and again keep in mind on a short rest you know that of course the the, does happen especially both of the these teams just come off of a tough loss uh, over the the weekend though in the fourth minute of stoppage time wow uh, Maxine Crapo man he got away with this one because he came off his lines he was trying to head it head it out and not only the fact that he missed that one the ball went right past him and there was Reynoso a chance to basically tapped it in but what a challenge that is for Kellen Acosta like that that is a game saving challenge there from Kellen Acosta to get that that one one away and, and basically prevent a corner because you know if he didn't make that challenge or if he actually fouled Reynoso there in the box it's a penalty and maybe maybe Acosta would have got got set, sent off in that sequence too but what a, a game saving challenge that is and then Gonzalez had one last opportunity for the Loons to get the late winner but he heads it wide from the header and yeah in the end it ends in a 1-1 draw in this one as the shots in this one 12 shots committed to 10 that LAFC had Two shots on goal for the free that LAFC had. Seven shots off target for the free that LAFC had. Three shots that was blocked for the four that LAFC had. And possession wise, 47% possession compared to 53% possession that LAFC has in this game. And normally, you know, for the Loons, getting a point against the, the team that is at the top of the Western Conference at home isn't really a, a bad reserve. But, you know, knowing the fact that the next game they're not going to have Reynoso again because of him picking up too many, many yellow cards and you know he made, made a silly yellow card uh late in the, in this one and the fact that the next game is against sporting casey on the road which that usually is an automatic like loss actually not usually but pretty much an automatic l for for the loons especially in the regular season yeah things are looking a little bit dire for 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 this team and that again i think this might be the game that really kind of killed their their chances in terms of a home play, playoff game and that now it's just simply this team team needs to to, to get themselves into the playoff p position. I mean, I know, again, they do have an easy s schedule. I mean, I know Sporting KC is not going to be easy when they have to go on the road. And again, very shorthanded going forward on the attack. But, you know, the last two games where they have to play on the road against the Quakes and finish the season at home against Vancouver, you know, that's not going to be e e easy to win, especially with this team struggling to score goals. Yeah, this this is gonna be, be be a tough one in that they they need at least one more win if they want to get themselves into to the the playoffs. But we'll see whether that's the case. But for LAFC, again, they just need to re regroup. It's been a bad run for for this team, and that you just hope that eventually they they'll, they'll find find it because because as playoff time comes, you do not want to head to the playoffs ice cold and potentially get get upset in the first round which is what LAFC really want to pre prevent because, again, this is a team that is MLS Cup or, or bust. If they lose in the first round, it would be considered a catastrophic failure. But that being said, uh, moving on into the next match, we got Houston versus New England. And speaking of playoffs, I think the Rams' playoff chances might have just gone after this game. I mean, I know they're, they're still in it after this game, but after this performance that they play against Houston... I, I don't blame any Revs fan. Decided to just say that this season is done and basically just call, call it because, my God, this was a really disgraceful performance for the Revs. Consider consider they have playoff hopes alive where the Dynamo just single-handedly dominate them throughout the entire 90 minutes of this game. Though, early on, uh, Bo did hit a one-hopper that was denied by Clark before uh, Bear thought that he scored the opening goal for the Dynamo, but it was disallowed for offside. Uh, Clark then robbed Hill as he went through on goal there, but McMahon did get a second crack of it, but it goes right to Clark. But then in the 30th minute, a penalty was given to Houston after VAR deemed that Farrell handball that one in the box. Now, I thought this was a harsh call. I mean, yes, the ball did hit the hand of Andrew Farrell, but it kind of also hit his hand and 
his shoulder and you know that's one that it's especially with him sliding down like that it is incredibly like, harsh to call that a, a a penalty but that being said uh Seba Ferreira had a chance to give the Dynamo the opening goal and that didn't happen because uh Petrovic denied him from the spot and immediately I wrote ball, ball don't lie because you know sometimes we have those ball don't lie moment and this is exact, exactly one of those moments though that penalty kick save was all for naught because the Dynamo eventually would get the opening goal in the 36th minute as it's Darwin Quintero scoring from Bear and Sarin to make it one nothing in favor of the Dynamo and continue to kind of frustrate Minnesota fans. The fact that yeah, Quintero can still still ball ball, uh, despite the, the 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 fact fact that you know he is winding down his his career. And yeah, that gives the Dynamo the one nothing lead, and that would be the scoreline heading into the second half. Though that lead would soon to be in jeopardize because a penalty was given to the Revs this time after VAR deemed that Parker bought down Bo in the box. Now this, I think it was the right call because you can clearly see Tim Parker make a rash challenge there to, to bring Bo down in the box, which Carlos Hill steps up for the penalty and he buries it. And that ties the game at, at one apiece. And you're just thinking the Revs, despite the fact that they were second best throughout this game, there's hope. The fact that they can come from behind and get the win in this one, right? Well, no. That is exactly not how it, it how the script wrote because Houston immediately looked to try to, to get the, the second goal back. And if it wasn't for what happened in the 70th minute with Georgie Petrovic making a rare quadruple save uh, on the same sequence, denying both Rodriguez, Fiera, Bear, and Pico in the box, yeah, they would have been, been two one down. And Petrovic is literally single handedly keeping the, the Reds playoff hope alive with him. his big save that he's been making. Though, that being said, in the 73rd minute, a penalty was given to Houston after McNamara would handball it in, in the box. I think this is now the second consecutive game that McNamara c commits a, a, a penalty because he handballed in the box. And this time, uh, it's Fafa Pico, the one that steps up to take the penalty, and he buries it. I mean, he rifled that one into the top, and no chance for Petrovic to save that, that one. And that gives the Dynamo the lead again, but they were not done because... Uh, teenage Adabi had a chance in the 81st minute that was blocked off the line by his own teammate Corey Bear. So yeah, that's got to be a rough moment for Hadabi that his shot was literally blocked off by his own teammate, but also blocked off the off the line. And that again, the, the Dynamo they were dominating this game. They were looking to try to put this game away, and they do. In the 85th minute, Fafa Pico would score from Bear to make it 3-1 in favor of the Houston Dynamo, and this is definitely going to be in contention for goal of the week and it's not often that Petrovic basically was just rooted to his spot and just watched this one goes into the top bin but that's exactly what happened I mean he absolutely puts this one at a place where no goalkeeper in the world would even save it hell I would say even two goalkeepers or three goalkeepers in the net would not save that one that was just put in a perfect place from Pico from long range that it was just a simple golazo there there from Fafa Pico and that yeah that gives the Dynamo a 3-1 lead but again, they're not done because uh, they try to make it 4-1 with Quinones shot, but uh, Petrovic was the, was able to deny him from the near post. And New England, they just looked like they were down and out. And maybe that that can be said about their playoffs hold too, because this was an incredibly flat performance for the Revs on the road. When you know, I don't know if they they realize that their playoff chances is, is dwindling after this game, and that yeah, you know, they with a, a loss like this again, I, I just sit. I know that they're still in it, and, you know, they can definitely bounce themselves back in the, the next game, but, you know, they need to do that because this this team, you know, you know, after this performance like that, it's hard to, to say that they can, can be a team that, that could bounce back, back easily and, and really push themselves into to the playoffs. But in terms of shots in this one, 21 shots for the 16 that the Rebs had, 11 shots on goal for the 5 that New England has, 8 shots off target for the 5 that Houston has, uh, 3 shots that was blocked for the 5 that Houston has, and possession-wise, 57% possession compared to the 43% possession that Houston has in this game. And overall, just a dominant performance here for the Dynamo, one of the better performance that they put this season. And also, it's not a big surprise because, again, it's that new head, head coach boost, or in this case, the new interim head coach boost after uh, with Paula Nakamura no longer being the head coach of this team. You just knew that the Dynamo was going to come into this game with much more energy and a lot of these players were going to try to impress their new new interim head coach and I'm pretty sure a lot of them definitely did, did after this performance. But that being said, I am now going to switch boards and look at the next 
of two games, or the last two games, to finish off in terms of the five-game action on Tuesday night of MLS match week number 31. So moving on in the next match, we got Sporting KC versus DC United, and this was also another game that was pretty much dominated by the home team, and unsurprisingly, Sporting KC was was able to get probably the easiest win that they had this season with a comfortable three-nothing win against DC. Though the first 18 minutes, I mean, if you didn't catch the first 18 minutes, you did not miss much because it was pretty much much very boring. The first shot didn't came in the 18th minute when Johnny's tried to 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 slide it in on the doorstep of goal, but he blasts one into the stands and into the supporter section. Uh, then Johnny's had another chance uh, from the free kick, but he fires that one wide. And again, Sporting KC, I thought they were dominating in the match, and they started to create some chances to get the opening goal. Uh, Ochoa then had to tip Espinosa long range shot over, but in the 33rd minute, he cannot prevent Kyrie Shelton of finally scoring his first MLS goal this season and finally end, ending his, his goal scoring curse that, that he has this this year to give Sporting KC a 1-0 lead. Though that lead looked like it was short-lived when Bentek had the first big opportunity for them, but he puts it, puts it high. And then Pierre on the other end went through on goal but could not keep him composure and puts it high from close range. And we had to have time with Sporting KC leading 1-0. Now in the second half, uh, Eric Tommy tried to go for a long-range effort. And we know Tommy can definitely hit those long-range effort close. But this time it goes wide. And then McIntosh was able to deny Kamara from close range. And Kendall McIntosh getting his first start for, for Sporting KC. And I thought he had a good game in, in this one. Even though he didn't have a lot to do in, in this one, he did have to make some save. And he actually even made an incredible save later on. In this one, uh, but Voltaire then curls one high in the 64th minute before Ochoa denying Russell in the near post in the 67th. But in the 69th minute, Sporting KC got that second goal, and it's Valadere, the one that gets the the second goal for Sporting KC, and that's his first career MLS goal. Though that one probably shouldn't have happened if o Ochoa didn't didn't perish that one. I mean, I feel like that one was hit straight to to Ochoa and Ochoa just kind of late to Riyadh and as good as a game that David Ochoa has against RSL yeah this was kind of a hu huge letdown game he didn't really had had his best game in, in this one but nevertheless that gives uh, Sporting KC the 2 nothing lead but then on the other end Benteke was looking to try to, to uh, get one back for DC but McIntosh with an absolute robbery on, on Benteke and his chance to get his first career MLS go uh, after he went went through on goal, but in the 87th minute, uh, Sporting KC would put the icing on the cake. It's Daniel Shawi, the one that make it 3 nothing in for Sporting KC, before Felipe Hernandez was also looking to try to get on the goal scoring sheet, but he was denied by Ochoa, and yeah, in the end, Sporting KC with a 3 nothing win over DC United, as the shots in this one, 17 shots for the 7 that DC had, 5 shots on goal for the 2 that DC had, 6 shots off target for the 3 that DC had, 2 shots that was blocked for the 6 that Sporting KC had, and possession wise, 60% compared to the 40% possession that DC has in this game. And overall, like I said, it was a pretty comfortable victory for Sporting KC in this one. And that, you know, they've been in a very good good run in these last couple of weeks. And that even though it's all, all for naught, I think there's definitely some promise for this Sporting KC team. And that I know usually sometimes when teams get into a good run late in the season and they have nothing to play for, you know, we don't usually see them carry into next season. But... I have a feeling it could because, you know, like I said, this team looked like, like they, they find their goal scoring for lately and their defense also hasn't been as a mess as what we saw in the beginning of the year. And not to mention next season they're going get, to get the likes of Polito and uh, Gadi Kine potentially back on this attack. Then all of a sudden, I think Sporting KC can definitely get themselves back into a good position and that maybe it's not as doom and gloom as what we thought that they, they were uh, after just not a, a bit of a disastrous season that they had this year. But that being said, uh, moving on into the last game on this board, and this was the game that pretty much is the reason why I am doing this review today instead of uh, yes yesterday, and that of course is Inter Miami versus the Columbus Crew. But it was also a big game too in a way where you know it was it was a true playoff six pointer between both of these teams, and in the end, it's Inter Miami probably get, getting their best best victory and the most most crucial victory of the season by winning two one uh, against Columbus, and early on our uh, room. Room did have to make a save on Greg, Gregory shot from close range as Inter Miami. They were, looked like they were lively early to try to get that that three points that they desperately needed. Though that quickly changes because uh, Calendar also had to make a save to deny Cucho 
from the free kick. I thought Cucho had a, a good game in this one, and that it's not a big surprise that he he was on the score sheet in in this one too. Uh, and I thought the crew kind of had more of the ball, but in terms of chances, it kind of was pretty even. That quickly changes because uh, Cucho just missed wide from close range before. He also heads it wide in the 22nd minute, and the chances were starting to come for the crew. Like, they were the one that was looking for that break, breakthrough goal, but instead, it's Inter Miami, the one that was able to do so. And it's Gonzalo Higuain scoring from Lasseter and Taylor to make it 1-0 in favor of Inter Miami. It was completely against the run of play, and also came on a lightning counterattack where the crew basically just kind of got caught when, when that transitional play was going. Though they looked like they were going to equalize quickly in the 29th minute, but the post denied Etienne and Columbus the equalizer. But they would get the equalizer in the 41st minute as Cucho Hernandez. Again, he's come close a couple of times. He finally buries it as he scored from Morea and Molino to tie the game up at one apiece. Though Robert Taylor looked to try to re re regain the lead for Miami, but he fires that one high. And we had to have time with this game tied at one apiece. And this is where the waiting game began because... Uh, the, the game, of course, would be, be under a weather delay because of, of lightning. And that it took about two and a half hours before the game restarted at around 11.35 p.m. local time. I mean, there was even talks of the fact that the game wasn't going to, to resume because there was just so much lightning around the, the area of the stadium. But they eventually did, did resume at 11.35 p.m. local time. And by then, pretty much, Dry Pink Stadium was relatively empty. But it definitely does not stop Inter Miami of chasing that, that second goal because in the 46th minute, uh, Taylor would hit one straight to Rome before Rome denied Higuain from close range. And again, despite the two and a half hour ring delay, which can, can definitely test the, the physical and mental aspect of these players, feels like Miami kind of dealt with it, it, it better because they were pressing to try to get that, that lead back. And they would get the lead back in the 82nd minute. And guess who? It's Gonzalo Higuain scoring from Pozuelo to make it 2-1 in favor of Inter Miami. And if Higuain is going to stay with this team this offseason, which, again, th there's going to be a big decision that this Inter Miami front office and Chris Henderson is going to have to do of whether or not if they want to keep Higuain uh, for, for another season because he has really been, been in form uh, ever since he got his, his starting spot back uh, from, from Leo Campana. Uh, yeah, you know, no, we're going to see that combination a lot with Higuain and Pozuelo being on the score sheet. And then Pozuelo trying to, to close this one out in the 86th minute, but he pu puts one right to Rome. But then Yoboa struck the post from 17 yards out as Columbus was in whisker away from getting the equalized. In fact, in the last uh, couple of minutes and heading into stoppage time, Miami was just bunkering. They were just hanging on for dear life to try to preserve this 2-1 win. And Calendar had to make a big save in the fourth minute of stoppage time, robbing Zyrian from six yards out. And that save maybe could be, be proved to not only be a season-saving save for Miami, but maybe a save that they might look back as as if they do make it to the playoffs. But that save is a re one of the biggest reasons why they're at there. Because in the end, it's a huge 2-1 victory that Inter-Miami has against Columbus. And the shots in this one, 13 shots could be 11 that Miami has. Six shots on goal for the three that Columbus had. One shot off target for the nine that Columbus had. One shot off block for the four that Miami has. And possession-wise, 58% possession compared to 42% possession that Inter-Miami has in this game. And overall, you know, for Inter-Miami, not only getting the big win, but now they're only one point behind the Columbus crew in terms of the playoff standing. And it's safe to say that their playoff hope is truly alive. Though, again, you know, this is a home win. And as I said before, I feel like Inter-Miami... If they want to get themselves above, above the red line, they need to win those road games. Or at least get points on the road. Because I don't think they have a lot of home games left this season. I think they maybe have like one or two left left this season. I mean, I know they at least have one because they have to play against Orlando City. But I believe they do have another home game. So they do have a couple left. But, you know, they need to get those, those road points if they want to get above the red line. And for Columbus, yeah, it, it's definitely, definitely concerning time with the way way that you know those home points that they they've dropped throughout this season is the only reason why they haven't clinched the pl play playoff spot right now and it's getting to a point where you know they need to get those those home points i mean they also have have, have some some home games left in season but they need to do so because if they don't this team can definitely fall out of the the play playoffs and if they do 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 that they're definitely going to point out those those drop points at home as the biggest reason why they might miss the playoffs this season. 
But that being said, that is pretty much it for the review of those five games that happened yesterday. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you guys leave a like and smash the subscribe button as we have another four games that's going to be happening tonight and the Compiness Cup, though I'll do an individual video about the Compiness Cup because anytime when you have like a, a game that has a trophy on the line, you know, I have to do an individual video of, about it and also congratulate the, the winning team of that game. But until then, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash the subscribe button, and yeah, I of course will see you guys next time.